Around 1879, a former Confederate Army officer received a letter from Europe. The writer, a famous painter and printmaker, recommended sculptor Joseph Boehm for a commissioned equestrian statue of a celebrated general who had fought for the South in the Civil War. Concluding his missive, the artist wrote, let me recall myself to your recollection as an old West Point comrade who has never forgotten the high opinion all held of yourself and the veneration we had of your father. The recipient of this letter was George Washington Custis Lee, who in 1854 had graduated first in his class from the Military Academy at West Point. The venerated father and subject of the proposed statue, Robert E. Lee, was reluctantly serving as superintendent of the academy at the time. The letter writer, Custis's fellow West Point cadet, had gone on to create one of the most famous paintings by an American artist. Its title was Arrangement in Gray and Black No. 1, but it is more commonly known as Whistler's Mother. Cadet James McNeil Whistler, the son of a deceased academy graduate and career officer, enrolled at West Point in July 1851. The following year, Robert E. Lee, who had served with distinction in the Mexican-American War, was ordered to assume the superintendent's duties, which he considered a snake pit, confiding to a professor that he had never undertaken any duty with such reluctance. Lee biographer Emory M. Thomas cites young Jimmy Whistler's time at West Point as an example of Lee's duties and vexations at the academy. Lee, then a colonel, granted a request by Whistler's mother Anna for a leave for her son to bid her farewell before she left to travel to Europe. Lee agreed, but for a shorter time than Anna Whistler had requested. Before he wrote to her, however, Lee consulted Whistler's professors and the schedules of the boats and trains on which the young man would travel and Whistler's mother was not the only parent who requested some indulgence. By year's end, Whistler had collected 116 demerits, more than the number mandating his dismissal. However, Lee and the Commandant of Chiefs had the discretionary authority to examine demerit records and excuse some infractions if the cadet's general conduct and potential justified the mercy. Lee exercised his authority, expunged 39 demerits, and salvaged the young man's career for the moment. Thomas writes that during Whistler's third year, Lee had to write a letter to Engineer Chief Joseph Totten urging a favorable response to Whistler's request for permission to receive some articles of underclothing from his mother. So responsible was the superintendent for everything that happened at West Point that a colonel and a general had to correspond about Whistler's underwear. But that June, Whistler was principal in what was probably the shortest examination in the history of West Point. Second Lieutenant Caleb Hughes commenced Whistler's chemistry examination by asking the cadet to discuss silicon. I am required to discuss the subject of silicon, Whistler responded. Silicon is a gas. That will do, Mr. Whistler, interrupted Hughes. In 13 words, Whistler failed chemistry and flunked out at West Point. His petition to take another examination in chemistry was on Lee's desk within a week. So Lee had to review once more Whistler's record in chemistry and conduct. Having done so, Lee could find reason neither to re-examine Whistler in chemistry nor to excuse enough of his demerits to prevent Whistler's mandatory dismissal. I can only regret, Lee concluded, that one so capable of doing well should so have neglected himself and must now suffer the penalty. Lee's remark about Whistler's capabilities was informed by the fact that, whatever his deficiencies in chemistry, Whistler was first in his class in drawing. After flunking out of West Point, he briefly worked for the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey. He found the work dull, but learned how to do etchings, which later greatly served his artistic career. He left for Europe in 1855, never to return to the United States. Lee, to his relief, also relocated in 1855, when Congress authorized four new regiments, two infantry and two cavalry, to protect settlers on the western frontier, and Secretary of War Jefferson Davis named Lee second in command of one of the cavalry regiments. In 1860, from his post in San Antonio, Lee sent his wife a newspaper clipping on Little Jimmy Whistler's successful exhibition. The article probably referred to the acclaim Whistler received at London's Royal Academy for what is widely considered his first masterpiece, the painting At the Piano. Lee wrote, I wish indeed he may succeed in his career. He certainly has talent if he could acquire application. Whistler spoke fondly of West Point for the rest of his life and claimed, had silicon been a gas, I would have been a major general. 
This was the kind of zinger you'd expect from Whistler, who declared in his famous 10 o'clock lecture that nature is usually wrong. But as it turned out, Whistler's old classmate Custis Lee did become a Confederate Major General by the end of the Civil War, and chemistry instructor Caleb Hughes served the Confederacy as an arms procurement agent and purchasing specialist, although he was from Massachusetts. Interestingly, Whistler was also from Massachusetts, but often claimed to be a Southerner, perhaps in part because his mother was originally from North Carolina, and his brother William served the Confederacy as a medical army officer, relocating to London along with other Southern refugees in 1865. The author of a book profiling West Point cadets who became famous for something other than warfare wrote, James Whistler had claimed to be an officer and a gentleman through all his life in exile. Again and again, his battles with friends and enemies took on the character of contests over his honor as a gentleman rather than as an artist. By the time Whistler wrote Custis Lee, he had gone bankrupt partly due to legal fees resulting from suing an art critic over a bad review. Whistler won his lawsuit for libel against John Ruskin, who called the painting Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Falling Rocket, a pot of paint flung in the public's face. But the jury only awarded him a fourth of a penny in token damages. Happily, a commission to do 12 etchings in Venice turned things around, prompting another Whistler zinger. They are not as good as I supposed. They are selling. As for Whistler's recommendation, if Joseph Boehm ever did a Robert E. Lee statue, I haven't been able to track it down, which may be just as well given the fate of Lee statues in this day and age. And it's probably also just as well that silicon isn't a gas. The Confederacy's loss turned out to be art history's gain. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.